So welcome everyone to uh, this week's Keep Your Search Centre seminar. I'm, I'm thrilled to uh, have the opportunity to introduce Christine Walton, partly because on a couple of previous occasions I couldn't talk to her. <laughs> one in UCLA, but also one in, one in Christine's house, believe it or not. And so I'm very, very thrilled to have her here. Um, as, as, as many of you will know, and also uh, I sent out an email to say this this morning, Christine is, is here on, on sabbatical with the Internet Institute and with the Research Centre. And they were and, uh, working on a new book. Some of you know her previous book, the, on, on digital scholarship. And um, the talks that this thing is giving while she's here are uh, part of the, sort of the rehearsal of the ideas in the book. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited by all what's going on here because uh, Chrissy should pay her um, a couple of years ago now, isn't it? Uh, the conundrum paper. That's about six months. Can actually. Oh, they actually came out yeah, on the journal. <coughs> um, and which has a model in it which uh, has a utility that transcends the, the paper. I think it's very, very useful. We've been discussing it in many research projects. What Chris is doing in the new book is extending that and applying it to some case studies. And today we're seeing a, a couple of those. And I'm quite excited by the. We, we always have a multidisciplinary audience here, but this is a very richly multidisciplinary audience today because I see a strong humanities contingent and a strong social science contingent. In the room, so thank you all for and zoology, curious anyway, <laughs> and astronomy. That's great. Science, yes. <laughs> and computer science. Yes. Yes, we're all here. So thank you very much, and um, I'll hand over to Christine. Thank you. Well, this this really is a treat to get this breath, and I've got um, collaborators. And Matt Mayernick is here from uh, the National Center for Atmospheric Research, who will collect some of these data. And uh, one of my research subjects, Stefano, has kindly come. Um, I'm not going to say too much about yours today, but we'll, we'll see how far we get on the other areas. Um, I, my approach to the book is to commit myself to give talks about three months in advance, hoping I will be there and have something to say about the topic by the time I get there. So it's, it's a forcing function. And uh, one doesn't usually get a video taped, uh, recorded when you're doing work in progress, but several people said they wanted the video, so we'll just go for it. Um, but what I really want is a good discussion with people and uh, to give you a sense of where I'm going, and these topics really are very, very broad. Uh, so this is the title that I gave to Dave in December, I think, for where I was hoping to be right now, but it's certainly part of the larger project of thinking about the data reuse. Now, I can't give a talk anymore without using this slide somehow or another. Uh, I think everybody in this room is somehow familiar with the flood of data. I like this metaphor because so much of the data is runoff. It's not being captured, it's not being kept, it's not being reused. And as the funding agencies are requiring people to keep their data and make it accessible, that raises some very challenging questions about what are those data. Those, if you look closely at those policies, you will not find a definition of data in them. Uh, so I'm spending quite a bit of time on that. Uh, but the other is if you look back over the couple hundred years that we've been publishing journal articles, you will see that no one has ever been expected to release their data before. So this is actually a very profound change in the nature of scholarship. And what I'm trying to do with this book is to look at the changing nature of scholarship through the lens of data and particularly this change in policy approach. The working title of the book is Big Data, Little Data, No Data. Why the long tail? Um, is there anyone who's not familiar with Chris Anderson and the sort of Amazon marketplace and the long tail metaphor? I think it's made popular culture by now. Uh, what this is used here is to think about the volume of data and the number of researchers. Uh, we have a project I'll show you in a moment uh, where Brian Hydorn did a study about five years ago of all the grants given by the National Science Foundation in the US, and he found that 98% of the grants were less than $1 million. And that represented 80% of the money. So only 2% of the NSF grants are over $1 million. You're really talking one or two investigators, one, two, or three years at most. Most science and social science then 
is out here. The people who are concentrating a small number of researchers, principally in astronomy, physics, genomics, and so on, have large volumes of data, but most people are very at various stages along the sail. And certainly, the social sciences are spread along, and most of the humanities you'll find way down here. So it's much more complex kinds of data. It's much smaller amounts. You don't have the industrial strength of human power to put together infrastructure to manage the data. <laughs> we have a small grant. Many of you will know these people here, Ian Foster, Carl Kesselman, Bill Howe, uh, and Brian and myself. So Brian Hydorn's group and my group are working on requirements, trying to understand what's going on in the long tail. And Ian, Carl, and Bill, of course, want to build stuff that will help tools and services for people farther down that tail. This is a quote from the JASIS paper that, that Dave just mentioned, that if the rewards of the data deluge are to be reaped, then researchers must share those data, and in such a way they do, data are interpretable and reusable. Those are very high bars, all three of those. Very little data gets released. Uh, when it is, it's hard to interpret. There's often not enough documentation to go with it, and being able to reuse it requires considerable domain knowledge and often a lot of documentation that doesn't exist. This report in 2005 from the National Science Board has been much quoted, and it's a useful start of at least some high-level categories of data, uh, but it doesn't go into any real nuanced way of thinking about uh, what our data. But at least it got as far as, say, things like observational data are the ones that are most, most worth curating, because those are the data that can, are associated with time and place and can never be repeated again. Uh, the computational data, the ones that come out of, say, workflows, so, so some of the things you're doing with the square kilometer array, some of those workflows, those might be more reproducible, uh, but you may not need to keep the data because you, you can actually crunch them again as with the experimental data. Okay. So those are to the high level of what people have been doing there. I have spent um, about the last month <laughs> writing a 40-page chapter with the title, What Are Data? Um, and it's one of the hardest things I have tried to do and wrestle it to the ground. Uh, and I come away with the sense that data is best understood as a rhetorical concept. It means very different things to very different people in very different circumstances. We have been uh, studying people on sensor networks for about 10 years. Matt's dissertation came out of those projects looking at how how met metadata did or did not get made by scientific groups. Uh, we've been working with astronomers for about the last five years, and uh, we interviewed them, and you know, we sort of got warm them up for a while before we kind of hit them with the what are your data questions, and you, you, get, uh, you always get puzzled responses. People have a very hard time explaining what are their own data when you ask them that as a direct question. You, you need to follow them around, and you need to uh, fall in quicksand like Jillian did, or go to about 15,000 feet in the Andes like uh, Matt did to follow people setting up seismic networks to understand what are their data. So this is the model that I'm building that's extended from the conundrum paper. Uh, so let me give you just a few minutes of, of framing this, which is that the size of the science, the project, I'm using science very generally to include all areas of scholarship, uh, does matter. Big science is a, a term that was coined in the 1960s to represent projects that are what a society invests in. So things like the, you know, the big astronomy projects where you've got a 10 and 20 year window of actually building it, where it belongs the little sciences is most kinds of scholarship. Big data, large volumes of data, I like the definition that uh, Ralph Schroeder and Eric Meyer are using of big relative to the size of the phenomenon. So when a field starts to use much more data, orders of magnitude more than ever has before, that may be big data. 
So it's not the absolute volume of data. You don't have to have exabytes of data to have big data relative to your problem. The origin of the data, I first distinguished between sources and resources in the scholarship in the digital age book, where sources would be data that usually that you collect yourself is the first time something has been uh, seen as a source of evidence, where resources would be some kind of collection, some kind of other item that is being repurposed as data. So I would put most of the humanities, the kinds of texts that Ellen and I have been talking about, as resources. They were written to communicate with contemporaries. They were not written as data. But they become data to you when you start to study the language, the history, the, the material culture that went around them. Um, external factors are things like ethics, economics, property rights, I've chosen examples for today where those are not big issues. The purposes for which you collect them, are you trying to do a big observatory for other people to use, or are you trying to ask a very specific question? You'll define your data differently. And then the processing of data is something that both defines what are the data and has a great deal of influence on whether those data become reusable or repurposable by anybody else. I'll talk about metadata provenance and the ways in which data are handled. So these are the case studies. The astronomy and sensor networks are what I'll talk about today. I've got the social networks coming along and the humanities. Stefano has been very generous with his time. And uh, this is a fascinating case because in his lifetime he has seen several generations of technology that have really changed the way he works and arguably what you're working with now in the, in the, the Chinese uh, Buddhist text is, is big data certainly to where you started or where you started your career. So if we have time we can go into that um, a bit as well. But everybody loves astronomy, whether you're no matter what, what your field is. And a, this is a, a picture, a astronomy picture of the day from NASA that uh, is from a day in January. If, if the contrast were better, this is going to really pop out at you. And it doesn't matter so much um, what it is, but to realize that people have been studying the sky since we knew the word people. And we have very old records of the sky, and we've got now a couple of hundred years of observations on glass plates on other kinds of records that can still be reconciled and people are continue uh, to work with. The, uh, the astronomy community does a decadal survey, comes out in you know, 2010 was the last one, where they get together, they spend years deciding where they should invest for the next uh, generation. And they are, so the, the kind of the work that you're working on, uh, Dave tells me you're working on the antennas for the SKA, and it's hard to get people to think about the scientific uses of those data, which is what, I mean, at least 10 years out. The Alyssa Goodman tells me that the mirror in the 8.5 meter telescope takes nine years for the glass to cool. I mean, you know, who works on these time scales? I mean, just a whole different kind of science than, uh, than most of us think about. So it's a great one to study. And uh, despite having spent five years since Alex Dolly first asked us to start working uh, with them on big data net proposal. I've just in the last week or two come to the point where I think I can even articulate what are astronomy data. It's, it's still pretty complicated to do. So I'm going to take us through these first with astronomy and then with sensor networks and then come back and compare them. So let's think about the potential uses and reuses. Now let me emphasize that this is an information perspective. This is not the way Alyssa Goodman or Alex Ale or other people who have been following around would describe themselves. This is trying to come back and say, what are the data, what could be reused, and why and how. So, um, the phenomena that astronomers generally are interested in is celestial objects. So it's sun, moon, stars, galaxies, things that go bang in the night, as George Urbowski keeps telling us. Um, the things, how they change, Alyssa Goodman studies how stars form. One of the things Alyssa keeps telling me is there is only one sky. 
and that's an extremely useful organizing principle because astronomers agreed on a coordinate system a long time ago. You can take those 200-year-old glass plates and you can actually map them to data that are coming out of today's telescopes because there's been a standard agreement. But the other is the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, you've got to know, so here's the spectrum from radio at the one end down to gamma rays at the other. And this little tiny bar in here, that's the amount that we can see. That, that's optical. Everything on the other side of this, telescope, telescopic instruments can capture. What, so you're seeing this, but there's a lot else out there. Now, each telescope operates, well, actually each instrument, the telescope has multiple instruments, and they each operate in a certain electromagnetic spectrum. So one telescope will get, can work in x-ray, another can work in gamma rays, these have to be up in the sky, these can be on the ground. Um, but notice already that you can't just point a telescope and see, say, I want to see stars form. <laughs> You've got to interpret the coordinates on the sky and the electromagnetic spectrum. It's a, you know, a 3D relationship and before you can see what the, what the objects are. You've got to take it through some kind of a model. So I mean, that's also why it's hard to explain. If you're a cosmologist, the data are the output of your models. It may only be a few kilobytes that goes in to launch the model, but what comes out of the model may be many terabytes. So even within astronomy, we've got very different senses of, of what our data. Now, for the rest of it, I'm going to work on observational data, but I want to set that up front right there. A cosmologist will tell you something very different about what are her or his data. Sources and resources. Data from the major missions, the European missions, the US-based missions, so they, I mean, they're all really uh, international missions will go directly into some kind of repository. So the in, like the Y satellite, the infrared, comes into the Jet Propulsion Lab in uh, Pasadena, goes into IPAC, the Infrared Processing Analysis Center, on the Caltech campus, and that's where you go to get it. It's organized by mission. So Spitzer goes one place. This is uh, the European extremely large telescope, the world's biggest eye on the sky. SKA is the world's largest radio telescope. Everything is bigger, better, flashier. <laughs> It'll be the biggest something, no matter what you look at. Um, what's, what's important here is that the data don't all go one place. So you've got to go one place for Spitzer, someplace else for Hubble, someplace else for Wise, uh, someplace else for this, or go someplace else for the square kilometer array data. There does not exist a single database or a single search mechanism where you can look for all those data. You cannot say, give me all the infrared, give me everything about Venus. You've got to know where to look. And each of these different places you look has a different data model, a different user interface, a different history, maybe slightly different coordinate systems. A whole lot of reconciling has to go on, despite the amount of agreement that exists on things like coordinate systems. If you got your own data by having an observing proposal to get data from an instrument, that may end up on your laptop. We have found data under people's desks in various um, well-known universities, in various places. I'm sure they're around, sitting on desks around Oxford as well. The data from the computational models, that tends to stay, as far as we can tell, with the community that collected it. Alyssa Goodman has seen these slides. This is her project. Um, uh, and so this is the one that I want to drill down to give you a better example of, of the data model. What are the data? A complete stands for Coordinated Molecular Probe Line Extinction Thermal Emission Survey of Star Forming Regions. Okay. The star forming regions, that, that part I can understand, and probably except for the SKA folks, um, the rest of you can as well. So what they did was, this is a multi-year project with funding from NSF. They wanted, they, had, they mapped three star forming regions in great detail. They're well-known regions. They went to Spitzer, they went to other places. They got the data from multiple wavelengths 
for these regions. Then they wrote observing proposals and they got more data to complement those around these star forming regions and produced the richest possible survey. So this is called a survey. But it's not a survey like the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which was one telescope. So it's a survey of three star forming regions built from extant data and from new data, by half its new data. This well known paper is one of at least 20 papers, I and mean, this is about the 20th paper from the complete study, a four page paper in Nature with another 12 pages of supplemental material, and then all points back to the complete database which is freely available on their website. This is also the first, the first 3D PDF. We won't, we, we won't do that today, but they do. Uh, so but that part of what their contribution was is take this very rich set and uh, use known, uh, known analytic tools and apply some new tools and uh, show how self-gravity was an important part, of model, important part of models. They did some modeling as well. Let me point out here the XYZ. So what you rotate is there's the X and Y, those are your coordinates on the sky, right ascension and declination. And then the Z is expressed as velocity. And you can flip this thing around so it's a 3D space and you can look at it in different ways. So star forming regions. That's what they were doing. So I said the first part of this, they processed it by pulling it all together. Then they got data from other places which they had to calibrate. <coughs> and if you look closely at that website, it says, we will we release the new data as we validate it. So from the, from the time that you folks are working on those antennas, the time the data are available, many different people will have touched it. So the physicist designing the instrument, those data might be the voltage off the charge couple devices. By the time you get to the cosmologist, you've got models at the other end. So they're dealing, they've got to take a whole workflow in between and reconcile it. They've got to use metadata from the archives and then come up with metadata for the new data. They've got to document all the sources of their data and their team workflow. Now, like I said, there's a couple dozen papers out of this project. And this is a project that actually keeps a lab notebook like this of every data transformation that happens. Um, and so they've got better documentation than most people, but if, if you try to go back and ask exactly what the transformation was in this step from a paper they did 10 years ago with three generations of postdocs back, they probably could not tell you. So it's more reproducible than most, but the true reproducibility will be difficult. So you've got, you know, the, the team that set up for astrophysics built complete, but you had a whole lot of people from the design of those instruments. I mean, Spitzer would have been designed a decade or two before they actually took data from it to use it. So there's many different ha pieces handling along the way. Uh, they used tools that were already well known, but then they also did some new methods on it, and they released it. So it's up on the website. Anybody else can come use this complete data set they built. And then they're, they're uh, building Dataverse, which is another store that Harvard built for social sciences. They're repurposing for astronomy. They're putting other data into there. Okay. So that's, that's kind of the big picture I wanted to give you. It's, it's a fast run I ran you through astronomy. Uh, but the scientific knowledge is required <coughs> So it's not just the data, to, you know, to make these data get some evidence out of them. You need to reconcile the observations, then you have to write proposals to get the new stuff to match it, and then to study, so if you want to study the, oops, if you want to study the objects and phenomena, you need to pull these things together. So their contributions with these data were, are the new data product, uh, and the ability to bring the diverse array of data to bear. So it's not the volume of data, it's the diversity of data, is, is their contribution, <coughs> and then their innovation in the methods and the visualization. So I'm going to stop there on the astronomy and move on to the sensor networks. I'm going to come back and compare them. So if anybody want questions on the astronomy before I move on? You all understand the strong data. That's good. <laughs> See if I can do the same for sensor networks. Okay. So, <coughs> so
sensor networks. Um, I was one of the founding co-investigators <coughs> for the Center for Embedded Network Sensing. Started in 2002, ran for 10 years, the funding ran in 2012, and uh, Matt's dissertation was funded through uh, and it's researched through these sets of projects. About 300 people at the peak of the center, 75 or 80 percent of those people in computer science and engineering, and the remainder were in the sciences, although near the end there were more uh, social science and humanities and medical applications that were brought into it. And it, at the beginning, it was more of an idea of an observatory. They were going to throw smart dust all over the environment, and it was going to stream all kinds of wonderful environmental data in and, and change, change the world with wonderful new technologies. Um, and it turned out to be more complicated than that, by far, and a paper that um, Matt and I and Jillian Wallace just came out last year talks about why that turned out to be so difficult. The case study I'm going to talk about is this one over here on the, uh, on the aquatic. This is a bit of what they, the sensor networks look like, the different technologies. They could move them around in 3D space instead of just putting up static uh, scaffolding that you had to climb up and, and still widely use. They have uh, robots uh, with buoys that move around in lakes and rivers. They've also got ones that, that dive and uh, get water from uh, farther down. A lot having to do with the, the sensors and the, and the receivers, and they, they burst data, and then the electrical engineers that take very information theoretic view of the network. Um, so just many different kinds of technology that are involved. And they, they sense really did innovate on the technology as well as the scientific uses of the technology. So again, I'm going to take us through these from an information theoretic perspective, and it would not be the way that these scientists would, um, would self-identify, but we have spent a lot of time at their side over the years. Okay, so here's the human in the loop. And uh, you know, again, we have a paper just talking about how, why it was they moved to human in the loop. The experimental technologies turned out to be not nearly robust enough to be left alone. They lost all kinds of data, the things would die, the battery life didn't survive, cows stepped on them, uh, people stole them, I didn't, and you had various vandalism up in um, parts of the Andes where you were trying to lay them, um, you know, power grid problems, you name it. <coughs> so they ended up doing much more human in the loop. The science got a lot better when they did the loop because then you could, you could kind of babysit the technology, you could work with it, and you got much more, uh, much more reliable data. So uh, adaptive sampling in the robotics was about adaptive sampling to the environment and being able to do more real-time uh, data analysis. So here's one that, uh, you know, Jill, did you, Julian did most of this. Did you go out this one, Matt? Out to James, not, not this particular one. James Reserve and the Lake Fulmore up in the mountains near, uh, in Southern California. So these are robotic boats and then, some, and then some things strewn across the river where you can move things across and drop, drop things down under the water. And notice the kinds of data they get. So this is a chlorophyll concentration at different depths. So this is depths, it's not electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and latitude and longitude, so, so they, they grid the picture. And this is temperature again at different depths of the lake that the sensors are able to get. Okay. Here the phenomena of interest is harmful algal blooms. Anybody ever come across them? I'm not sure they're a big problem in Britain. Sometimes Sometimes? Yeah, sometimes the rivers, okay. They're, they're very nasty. When it blooms, one algae uh, suddenly takes over and tens of thousands of fish will die all of a sudden. And you get huge environmental problems. They'll happen in Southern California and they, cause, they put out demolic acid that causes neurological damage to sea lions that then kill their young. I mean, it's really pretty horrible stuff. So a fair amount of money in this marine biology is going to try to predict harmful algal blooms, try to find, find out why one algae suddenly can, can take over. So they do have coordinates on land and in water, 3D, a, a bit like the astronomy. They're concerned about the meteorological conditions. That's one of the few kinds of data they go and get in advance. They want to know 
what the pattern of weather has been in this particular uh, lake. And then they want concentrations of algae and nutrients and so on. Now, just like astronomy, you can't just go study the blooms. You've got to study something else that will give you indicators of the blooms. So the sensors themselves really just get voltage. You do the kind of sensors. And then the voltage you take through models and you begin to see what you got nitrates, what your concentrations are, and so on. The network data, you can look at patterns and flows. The robotic people are taking robotic algorithms that came from weapons detection, and they're trying to use them to improve the targeting for where the algae are. Uh, the people, the biologists, are setting up wet labs in the field. They'll centrifuge things, they'll give the right pH concentration, and all of it has to be input to different kinds of biological models. What happens to these data at the end? Um, it pretty much goes to desktops or to lab servers. In fact, a lot of stuff just lives on laptops indefinitely, as, as far as we can tell. Uh, the, these are not fields that have any particular data repository. There's not a good place to put it. There's not an agreed ontology or thesaurus or a set of metadata standards for it. Their data also are their physical samples. Some of them they keep. They clean out the fridge about once a year and dump stuff. But that's sort of the, the data acquisition and storage uh, for this year. The purposes. Part of what's really fascinating here, we've, one of the papers is who's got the data that we also put out last year, is the computer scientists and the scientists working side by side in the field, they have very different purposes for being there. They, they, but they, they each need the others. It's a symbiotic kind of relationship. The biologists are looking for what triggers these things. The computer scientists want to improve the robotic algorithm. So the del they will publish in an engineering place, and the others will, will publish here, will publish in, in the science. So the biologists, they want that lake as an exemplar, but the computer scientists are trying to get something more generalizable out of this body of research. And together, they want to co-innovate. So the computer scientists and engineers need a real problem to build better technology, and the scientists need somebody to help build the technology for them to ask new questions. So it's, it's a, it tends to be a delicate relationship. Most of the papers coming on these projects were separately published. The scientists were published in their place, the computer scientists in their This is one of the few papers that has everybody on it. You notice we've got biological sciences, electrical engineering, statistics, um, and more computer science, and we have UCLA and um, that other school across town were built up. Into the <laughs> um, these are the sort of things they come out with. The phytoplankton in the lake and the similar pictures I showed you before. They draw nice graphs, not as pretty as it is a good one. No 3D PDFs. Um, these are more fun to look at, and their captions are fun. You, they look at like a persistent surface scum. And they, they count these things. So. So it's a good stuff to work with. So how do they process this? They don't get much in the way of data in advance. And what they do get in advance, they use for what we call background data. This was something else that came out of a series of studies, is the way Alyssa's team is getting data from Spitz and other places, it's foreground data. They are getting data from other places that they could do their research on. Uh, where, but they will use, the, there's other data they'll get as background that they'll use say, to calibrate their new data, but they may never report it. So, Sloan Digital Sky Survey turns out to be used often as background data because everybody trusts those data and they'll use them for, say, what are the distance between two stars? We trust those, so they'll use it to calibrate something else. And here they'll use this background data, they'll use the meteorological data to calibrate, but they may never report that they actually used it. So it may never get cited in their papers. They'll, they'll, they may go back to their previous data, their teams, they may go back to code, especially the computer scientists. What kind of metadata? Matt will tell you, not much. Okay. 
They all think they should do it better, but they don't put a whole lot of data on it. Uh, you can divide up these people between the Excel spreadsheet crowd and the MATLAB crowd and the R crowd. And the Excel spreadsheets tends to be the lowest common denominator of how data gets moved around between the different groups. And that's so well known that Microsoft is now investing in making the Excel spreadsheets more useful for science because they're not as robust as they might be given the way that they're, they're being used. We also learned to ask how people named their files because that turns out to be the, the master metadata scheme for most of these groups is what the file naming structure looks like and how consistent it is on their disks. We're not talking curation, we're talking fairly backup. And do you remember what you called it five years ago? That's, that's the metadata that we're finding out there. We're also finding spreadsheets with unlabeled rows and columns because everybody knows what was in those rows and columns <laughs> until they graduated and that was the end of that data. We found a lot of that out there. So the biology team documents its data, the computer science engineering team is getting the sensor data, and they have to clean it up and pass it off. We had people tell us there were three grad students between them and their data because it had to be reconciled, the time clocks uh, mashed up and so on before they could, so it's who you trust along the way. So there's still a lot of people in the stream uh, before you get to the data. So you've got lots of grad students out in the field, lots of people processing it. When the statistics team came in, that really made a difference. That's the first time they were able to get much more reliable data in the field. They come back from a big trip to Bangladesh, looking at, they were looking for arsenic in rice paddies, another big public health problem. Got home, a third of the data were bad. You know, how are you going to get better data? Statistics team went out with them started to find real-time visualization, and some of the data got much, much better. A little bit of this is genome data, you know, the, the, some of the critters, and that might go in a, in a data bank. Um, some of the software code goes in a place like SourceForge and Fresh Meats and whatever it's called now. But most of it doesn't stays in the lab. If you, if, if you ask for it and we trust you and you're willing, we're willing to do the work to help you interpret it, then the data might get shared. And that seems to be pretty typical. This is another slide we've used many times. Jillian uh, drew this. Um, Matt leaves tomorrow. Jillian arrives Thursday. We can have the, the sentence handout this week. And this is also the foreground background um, that we keep encountering. Is these data in the middle, the sensors collect about the science. Everybody seems to think those indeed are data. But the rest of it more belongs to different groups. The wet lab, the methyl mercury, these kinds of things. The biologists care about this, not of any interest to the computer scientists. The electrical engineers that want to map the network, they care about this, means nothing to scientists. The robotics people want to know if they hit their target, they need these data to assess the quality of their algorithms, but they basically abstract away the science. So all those things are data, but there's a real signal to noise. One person's signal is somebody else's noise to what they consider um, to be their data. All right, let me see if I can compare these. This is, a, this is the work in progress as well. Back, back to the model again. Astronomy, very clearly big, big science and big data. Sensor network's very definitely the opposite. There's both, there's some kind of a coordinate system. Um, there's a model you need to interpret the observations before, there, <laughs> before there's something that could be evidence, some source for evidence. Public disposition of those data, that's the ethics of the community. Ethics of this community is, is private. Those data really aren't, they aren't reconcilable and they're very experimental, they're very adaptive, that local environment, they're improving the technology, they're asking a very narrow question. It's not clear they're, they're particularly useful to anyone else. They're asking this question here about how stars form, but here we've got two very different questions, these teams that are out in the field. Um, here, the resource is existing data plus new observations. Here it's pretty much new observations for the science. There's community standards or metadata there. It's local practice here. 
provenance, a mix of community standards and local practice, really local practices. There's nothing, there's no place else they can go to standardize these things. Uh, the handling, you've got this team, but then you're trusting the data that you know were 10 years in a pipeline before they, before you got them. And here you've got two different kinds of teams handling data for different purposes and public versus releasing it um, on request. Um, and lastly is the foreground, background. You know, we're seeing the same kind of distinction, but there's much more use of public data as foreground in the, uh, in the sciences. And um, the data products are what you're coming out of here. There's some amount of data products, and for instance, all that data reduction that's happening in the science, but the software code, the code are the data in the computer science that, that, that we found also. Um, you've got to be a domain expert to reuse these. It's very difficult to use reuse these by anyone other than the ones who collected the data. That they're simply not documented. They were not, the science was not done in such a way of expecting that anyone else was going to make use of them. So let me stop there. So we've got money from lots of different nice people, from NSF, SEMS, Microsoft, and a very nice grant from Sloan that will continue in the astronomy work and some others. And I'll leave this up as a bibliography of some of the recent, recent papers that we've been looking at. So I said I want to leave plenty of time for questions and want to know if this makes sense. This sounds like a book you might want to read. Yeah. <laughs>